oh, we have a police here. We are safe. But as soon as the gun fighting started, they ran away. Fine. I only have one shotgun. That's all I have. We will continue to serve this community by doing the proper way of business. I'm a globetrotter. You and I pick your now. How do you mind? We know that I will just different. I don't want to. Georgia, I'm a GB now. Such a naga. She's a no bala. I'm a globetrotter. You and I pick your now. How do you mind? We know that I will just different. I don't want to. Georgia, I'm a GB now. Such a naga. She's a no bala. I'm a globetrotter. She can put your shit again. I'm talking money calls. Rose, you get it in me. I'm talking money meant the moves. I've been killing it now. I did that be me. Chop on it. Bum and I ain't it. I'm a globetrotter. I'm a globetrotter. Korea Town, Oshinge Sol, Hanyo Hamida. All right, 150. Impact. Impact. All right, 200. Impact. Impact. Nice. Okay. Okay, so 250. So for guys out there, uh, the tar the sighting system on this, there's two positions. The front flip is the large aperture for close range engagements, and the large, ap the small ring aperture is for long range engagements, much like the Gordon or late M16A1s. And so I zeroed this at the 300 meter setting, so close to the 350 yards, and I'm having to hold very low, which is an issue for this one because I don't see the entire target on the lower half. So I'm going to have to figure out sort of mentally where to hold it. Right, because you're basically holding it in the berm in front of the target that you're now going to be shooting at. Correct. Okay, uh, that was low on the, tar it was an impact, but it was low. You can come up uh, probably six inches. Dead center. Nice. Nice, okay. All right, 300. Uh, that just sailed over his head. Mm. Quarter target high. Impact. Impact. All right, I had. I already had uh, to uh, bump uh, it uh. off target to the right for those. Uh uh uh. Not yet. Not time to put the sight right on the target yet. Yeah. <laughs> That's what happened on that first shot, wasn't it? Yeah. I I, I figured 300 and 350 were pretty close, so I basically just sat it sat the sight onto the chest level and it it went over. Yep. All right, 350. You know, the elevation looked good. It was just off the right. And just off the left. Uh, that one was a little bit on the low side. Impact. Upper chest. Dead center. Impact. All right. I mean, in all fairness, you're doing okay so far. I mean, yeah. A couple so misses, far, let's but... not speak too soon. This is, I mean, in all fairness too, like you're saying, 350 meters or 300 meters 350 yards this is regular this encompasses already most of your combat engagements yep uh, that you would be looking at to, to begin with i only see a speck of white knowing that it that is the head position and i'm going to try to place it uh, right where that head position is to see if uh, basically, a head hold would land my shots at the chest or belly area at 400 uh, yards. Okay, let's do it. Impact low, low, right on the bottom edge. If you can give it a tiny more, give it a tiny more. <laughs> nice, dude. <laughs> Are you serious? Yes. Okay. 450. Impact. Perfect. Another. Impact. No. <laughs> Bro, no. No. <laughs> what? No. Uh-uh. Ah. Uh-uh. 500. We're there. 500. Okay. That was a full target left at the head level. 
Okay, uh, you're much closer. Okay, elevation's good. That was off the left by half a target. Off the right. That's an impact. Just over the right shoulder. Okay, all right, all right. That one was high by uh, two thirds of a target on the right edge. Just short. Mm. That's it. Got it. Tough, <laughs> tough. Well, we found the line there, didn't we? Yeah, we did. So basically what I was doing for that last target, you see the, the uh, 650 uh, gong behind it? That 650 gong right behind it was where I was placing the elevation for it. Wow. And once I figured that out, I was using the edge of my front sight as a reference point because that one target is off to the left of the 500 yes. yard target. And by using, basically I was aiming at the 650 using that as a correlation to where I was dropping the rounds to the 500 by using Josh as a uh, forward observer. Kind of like how you would shoot artillery with really bad sights. So, uh, I, think, I think the really interesting takeaway to all of this, Henry, is yeah. using a single position sight, uh, holding under, holding dead, holding over uh, for the duration of the course and still being able to clear it. Uh, something that we've definitely struggled to do on like older videos with older runs. Mm -hmm. And so I think it, one of the bits here that's probably worth us really covering off in the debrief is this particular part of the run. Yeah, using rud even more rudimentary sites than... Um, oh, hey, I have a dragonfly right here. Hello. Hi. Oh, he's hanging out. Did you kill the dragon? No, no, he's there. He is flying off. Full of harmony today's run with nature. Anyways, um, and industry. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> segueing back, uh, we uh, it's certainly uh, the using a single point iron sight it certainly takes a lot more uh, takes a lot more practice in in my opinion and and you could i think the audience could probably see that I, that is one thing that i had struggled with a little more before is how i was only able well that, to get that's on that the piece that i kind of want to talk about more at the debrief but you can see the very obvious and clear wall of where mm. you're having to hold over so much that you're obscuring the target so much that yeah. your reference to that target becomes you know ineffective in terms of being able to hit it yeah so this is absolutely a an interesting rifle to look at it's a very rare rifle now in the u.s and we'd like to thank our friend steven for loaning it to us uh, might i say uh, the mcx is probably the k1a1 we have at home <laughs> and not the other way around but there's more on that at the debrief we'll catch you there Well, hello there. You just caught me enjoying some of the small pleasures of life with a few of my soul brothers. I hope you're enjoying the show thus far. Shows like this, they're brought to you by Slate Black Industries. But more importantly, we have the support of the patrons of Patreon and the supporters on Utreon. And that's right. This magnificent group of men and women, they support us Financially, intellectually, and most importantly, emotionally. So today, I'd like to invite you to come join us. Become one of us. Together, we can unlock some of the mysteries in small arms development. But if you cannot, that's okay. We completely understand it. We'd be just as happy to see you down there in the comments section. But for now, let's get on with the show. All right, welcome into the debrief for what I think was a shocking run for us because Henry, I know when you and I sat down on this, 
neither of us thought that this thing was going to clear the course in the number of rounds. Like I, I think we both thought that this was either going to be a fail or high 30s in terms of round count if it passed. And there you were like, stacking them up out to 450 <laughs> no i i didn't expect it i mean you know i didn't expect it because i was i when you suggested for me to just shoot the k1 on the course i mean my face <laughs> to you was a whiskey tango foxtrot type of type of ex- expression to josh so when we did shoot it uh especially with this type of sighting system a sing basically a single point sighting system I, yeah i was flabbergasted to say the least um but i think the existence of the k1a1 should be it should be discussed before we even get into the shocking performance of it because i think um the k1a1 has strangely and interestingly become that symbol of korean or south korean nationalism uh overseas particularly in the united states uh for korean immigrants and rightfully so i think it's a it's a pretty nicely it's a pretty decently designed uh rifle and uh, we will get into the categories of rifle and submachine gun but um it doesn't have any reliability issues it can shrink to a really short package the k1a1 was initially designed as a submachine gun and you know it was a 10.5 barrel to begin with as the korean military adopted it and so um overseas it it had seen use in the korean military but specifically the k1a1 was an export model to the us so they had to lengthen the barrel to 16 inches and put the flash hider all the way out here Uh, but this was also during the 80s when it was being made and uh the koreans back then were not shy (laughs) in making a few bucks on the civilian firearms market and so they were competing with let's say the mainland chinese norinko and and some of those guys but they had a product right here that used the american cartridge that was domestically produced Uh, it was more expensive Uh, back then to buy than let's say like a type 56 but to the korean shop owners let's say in la or you know all around america they wanted some of them wanted to buy the indigenous south korean rifle and rightfully so and it is a very well designed rifle but on the fateful day uh on the la riots the K1A1 found its way to the rooftops in defense of some of those Korean businesses. And um, and so forever, red polo shirt holding the K1A1, uh, meme-wise, it has just spread like wildfire. That's just become a symbol for a lot of Korean diaspora. You know, Henry, what I would add to that, the roof Korean sort of, you know, uh, concept, it, that I I would argue s- spreads beyond at least in the U.S. today. It spreads beyond the the just Korean culture. That I think has become a symbol of a of a self reliant individual, regardless of you know race, color, creed, who is doing what should be done in terms mm-hmm. of defending life and property with their firearm, and so. You know that that sort of sort of a life ethos of a, of a way of a way of thinking and, and what should be done. I think that sort of permeates mm-hmm. beyond uh, just Korean culture into mainstay American culture at this point. How can we put this? It's a it's a stubborn Americanism mm. of self reliance is what this is. You, like and like you said, it, it's a mentality mm-hmm. of exactly. Being and I think that's why that's why you know right. that that particular. What has become like a, 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 it's so popular, it's become a meme now of <laughs> that we not so subtly also used in our video. <laughs> that has a deeper running context than just about the rifle or about that particular incident or about that particular photograph. Yeah. So the, the other thing that I, I wanted the audience to consider too, when these were being imported into America, 
uh, on the side of it, so were the Chinese Kalashnikovs, the Chinese Type mm -hmm. 56s. And the interesting thing is, earlier when I was talking to Dave, uh, whose family used to distribute the Type 56 and Norinkos, Polytex, and, and all that back in the 80s, he was talking about trying so so they were actually approaching a lot of those korean store owners to see if they would also want um, type 56s to, to sell uh gun store owners but mm -hmm. overwhelmingly the mentality was a, a resounding no they didn't want a communist weapon yeah and that uh, that's so, definitely where you see the the division based on that. i mean that's it's kind of that that is actually almost when when you and I first started our journey into sort of learning about firearms, that thought that that way of thinking still actually kind of existed for the Kalashnikov in the U.S. in cert, within certain circles and certain people. Yeah. Now I'd say it's it's completely gone. We're far enough removed, probably from. Mm -hmm. um, from that era for it to have sort of disappeared in a 10 to 15 year or 20 year time span. Or rather I would say uh, the population or the, the, the groups that still hold those beliefs That's right. don't publish online in the same forums that we typically see. So we don't That's see right. it um, under the limelight as much just because, yeah, just because it doesn't approach the yep. internet as much I agree. as our generation does. I think this is probably a, a perfect point. Uh, yeah, so, if, so, if you're good with it to pivot into the actual setup of the firearm, because you mentioned, and you talked about the differences between the 10, five and the 16 inch gun. And there are some stipulations mm -hmm. here that are worth talking about. I think a bit further. So let me talk about the reason of this barrel, though. The initial design was a 10.5, and the K1A1 was initially designed and considered as a submachine gun. Now, I know a lot of guys out there are going to say, yeah, but it is a rifle cartridge. That is true. The late 70s era, the submachine gun was interestingly designed. Remember the Sturmgewehr 44 was the MP44 before it was the STG-44. And the XM-177, the precursor to the M4, was a designated a submachine gun. And so was the AKS-74U. The Krink was also a submachine gun. So submachine gun technically, especially for that era, was not defined by the caliber of, of, of choice. Uh, so this was actually about this long in the Korean military, and it runs a 10.5 barrel. And running a 10.5 barrel, as you would think, with basically single position iron sights, because the second position is a large ghost ring on the back, is going to be exceedingly difficult to press past like two, 300 meters, to be honest. Let's talk about why that is, Henry. Why the 16 inch gun versus the 10 and a half inch gun with the single point sighting system becomes more difficult at range in case somebody isn't necessarily following along with you. All right. So, um, I zeroed this like I would zero an M16, to be honest, I pushed it out to 300 meters and I got, uh, the, the point target hit and I made sure the elevation was, uh, was matching at around the 300 meter mark. I do that because typically your most, combat engagements are going to be 300 and in. So as a practice from the US military, we would zero things at a 300 meter zero. As we look at, um, as we look at pushing farther, your sight post has to compensate higher because your bullet, bullet is dropping lower, of course. And so as you're pushing farther out, you're trying to push your sight post higher and that tends to cover the target itself. So as you get to 500 yards, as you would imagine, 450 meters or so, that side post is completely covering the target. And so when I was shooting at that last target that you saw, it was, I couldn't see the target as I was firing. Hmm. And 
to then extend that that that's a that's a perfect explanation obviously of of why on this particular run the performance there was the drop off around the 450 meter mark 500 yards because then you were really just holding in space and sort of lobbing the rounds over towards the target so right Henry having to hold above the target would happen sooner with the 10 and a half inch gun than with the 16 inch gun. And therefore his quote unquote effective range in this particular case ended up being about 450 yards, 400 meters. Well, that would have likely come in um, a bit with the 10 and a half inch barrel uh, due to the greater amount of variability in the drop. I mean, that's basically what we're saying, right? But but if you think of the original design, if this had a ten and a half inch barrel, Josh and Josh has shot this rifle quite a bit on the on the flat range too. As a t- if this had a ten five, the size of it, it's like an HK thirty three uh, size on the flat range. It's true. I didn't take it. Yes. I didn't take it into Koreatown, Henry. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but, right, but but it is a very the, it is a very it is a very nice and compact package, which let's say <clears throat> you were you had to pull security mm. on a rooftop. Let's not designate where. You're probably looking at what? In in an urban environment? Two hundred meters? Yeah, like down a street, maybe? right? Down a street. Yeah. You could have like a really long causeway, but that seems fairly unlikely. Most of it's going that to be that really Yeah. That gets into if you're on a defensive position and you're talking about pushing, like pushing 100 on a defensive mentality is one thing already. Pushing 200, like two football fields away is like, eh, yeah, I'm okay. Like if they're, if they're actually like firing at you, but like you start pushing farther and farther and farther in mm-hmm. that, that becomes into an offensive territory. The, the K1, the K1 itself though, um, I thought it was well suited for that role if you're talking about like a one or 200 meter engagement. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I think the same argument can be made to for, for a bunch of different rifles, to be honest. But but yeah, I don't disagree with that assessment. The, the thing that I would say is that for me shooting this, it was it's fairly obvious that this firearm is not meant to have like a 16 inch pipe sticking out the front of it right? Like in its original design, the balance is a little odd. The, Mm -hmm. the, the, the style of stock being like completely skeletonized and extremely, extremely, um, sort of ahead of its time, I would say in some degree, like the, it's like a wire stock basically. Right. And maybe ahead of its time is wrong. Yeah. yeah, Maybe ahead of its time is no, it is a grease. It's copied from the grease. gun, Right. So, so maybe my, my assessment of ahead of its time, when we look at PD, what I'm trying to get at here is when we look at PDW stocks or sub gun stocks of today that operate in the same fashion, they're usually exceptionally stout and, um, and complement the firearm really well. In this particular instance, my assessment would be that this is like not a good stock at all. It's extremely flimsy. It, it, it can't, it doesn't allow the user to handle the recoil of a two, two, three, five, five, six round without the firearm moving quite a bit because there's quite a bit of play within the stock. And so some of those things, like and just the weight of the gun, the weight of the barrel, you can feel that on the stock, in my opinion, while you're, you're shooting it. Um, and so those things now, lead me to the conclusion of you can definitely feel that this was meant to be a ten and a half inch gun. Now, I, I one thing to to what you were saying, I do think the the firearm itself was ahead of its time, um, but just a, just a thought that came to mind. So this is a sixteen inch barrel, and if we could presume that the entire rest of the firearm was done up the same way as a 10.5 would have been done up. You're adding basically an extra four, uh, six inches of dwell time to a 10.5 gas system. Mm-hmm. And I mean, you shot it yeah, and you felt the recoil on it. It feels stouter than a normal 16 inch on I, the recoil. I and would definitely agree with that. With, I think it's a number of with factors. a combination. Yeah. Yeah, with a combination of the wire stock, exactly. I would say exactly. those two added together are not ideal. Um, and 
for our audience out there, what we mean dwell time is basically when you're firing a rifle, the gas goes through the gas system and pushes on your bulk carrier group and cycles the system. Now, if you add this much uh, barrel, so your, your bullet is still coming out and is still plugging the barrel and you're pushing even more gas into the back, that's called dwell time. So you're basically adding a, a little bit more of the bulk carrier speed hmm. as it cycles. But even with that, it, I didn't see any reliability issues, True. which I would say speaks to the design itself, though. True. Yeah, I, I think that no. that's a fair assessment. It's not like it, it again, within context, right? 5.56 five, does not recoil significantly. But when you shoot a right. gas tuned system versus something that's not gas tuned, you can obviously feel the difference. And when you shoot something mm -hmm. that has. You know, so it's basically like shooting a 16 inch. The way I can equate this is it's basically the difference between, between shooting a 16 inch AR with a overgassed carbon length gas system compared to a 14.5 mm -hmm. mid length that's somewhat gas tuned, right? That's probably what we're talking about in terms of where you can start to feel those differences. And this mm -hmm. particular setup, the K1A1 with the 16 inch barrel, feels much more like shooting a 16 inch carbine with you know, that's overgassed than it does, right. you know, a, a gas tune system of any sort. It's like, you know, those crinks, the SLR 104 FRs that Arsenal was importing back in the day mm. uh, with a long, with a long 16 inch barrel to make it legal. Yeah. <laughs> those things were brutal to shoot uh, just by itself. And it was a five, four, five. Mm -hmm. That's the same concept. They had to make it civilian legal, but they didn't mess with the gas system. They used the original gas system. Just but slap, a just slap a new it. pipe on there, right? Yeah. Now the 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 on the flip side, the K one A one, the stock itself, is worse than the stock that comes on those arsenals, uh, because of course the Arsenal SLR one hundred four UR has the solid, uh, well, the AK one hundred esque type of stock on them mm -hmm. which is a, a solid stock so you have a better stock support there so you're running two things you're running you know a, i'm guessing you're running more gas but then also a worse stock to absorb the recoil and stabilize yeah. it and to where when i was shooting it, i remember i kind of had to de i wasn't death gripping it but i was at, you know trying to control it just a little bit more um, than what you what I would be doing on a gently gassed rifle. You know, honest. I would say, Henry, it's also for for the type of shooting that I was doing with it, where it was close range shooting, um, heads up, moving and shooting, um, that type of stuff. It wasn't. It was like okay, but one of the things I noticed is that the shape of the rear of the receiver and where the iron sight was sort of had you placing your head with your cheekbone right on the rear of the receiver and i saw the audience will probably see it too now if they go back and look or if you uh if you do some sweet sexy editing and put a nice uh, shot over where you got your your eye a little a little, a little pop from the receiver <laughs> partially that is also from me shooting an m16 being trained in the u.s military mm -hmm. that's that's what you do nose charging handle right you put your eyeball really close to your yeah. uh, rear aperture sight and, and you keep that reference point so partially i'm i'm just comfortable shooting it that way just because but yeah i mean if that stock also were to collapse in whoo, whoo. <laughs> you know uh that would not be a pleasant uh pleasant outing I, one thing i, I want to jump back to though you were talking about it being a forward leaning system I do agree with you that it was a forward leaning system. It was a system that looked into potentials that m might I say even the AR-15 did not look into mm. um, because the bolt system itself uh, is largely an AR-15 bolt, but you know, chopped in half. The Operating system is what you call direct impingement, or, or rather what you call internal piston nowadays. But being able to relocate the recoil system up here uh, with dual recoil springs. The recoil system itself 
kind of resembles the later AR-18 dual recoil spring system uh, as it operates. And because of that, you're able to remove the back end and be able to use collapsing stocks or folding stocks if you would like. And so the system itself, I think, was more forward leaning. Um, and uh, the Koreans, because they initially had the license to produce the M16s, but they didn't want to just produce the M16s because one, the license was restricting, but two, they also wanted a, a, a an indigenous design, um, and not just for nationalism, for but for a very pragmatic reason that you don't you want self reliance in weapons design and weapons technology. Um, I think those requirements kind of push them to address some of the issues that the AR-15 uh, recoil system, the, the buffer system, the stock tube, uh, limits the, the firearm. Something that we run into with, um, let's say, nowadays, a lot of guys, they would drop uh, law folders, mm -hmm. uh, like what is it, law tactical folders, um, yep. that basically you could fold that hinge on the on the AR-15, but you, you cannot get past the first shot with a law folder. Um, and that is done that way um, to but try to sidestep one of, might I dare say, a design flaw. <laughs> I'm hesitant on saying that in getting guys with pitchforks on the internet <laughs> of the AR-15. I can see um, it now. Clip it, guys. Yeah. Henry says the AR-15 is flawed. You know what? Uh, if people with pitchforks come, you know, I go to the rooftops and kind of look out for them for a little <laughs> while. And, but what do you say? You think I'll be all right? There's only <laughs> one way to find out? <laughs> I'm a globetrotter. You and I pick your name. So obviously we don't want to find out the hard way, right? <laughs> but but um, I, I thought that this was a good point to to bring up. The recently I I saw that Law Tactical is actually coming out with a recoil system that is a cut in a half AR bolt with a dual recoil mm -hmm. spring in it that fits into a typical AR-15 uh, receiver. Uh, so they could use a their side, side folding stock and fire it at the same time. So a very peculiar arrangement for the North American K1A1, wouldn't you say? Uh -huh. Now, one thing, Interesting. One thing though, um, I think I mentioned, did I close it out in the video that this, this is basically, or the MCX is basically the K1A1 we have at home? I did. Mm -hmm. That's what I said. Yeah. Or the other way around yeah, or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I still, you know, obviously the operating system is different, but the general outcome of the firearm is similar to what they mm. were trying to accomplish. And so I still right. stand by that, that the MCX basically was taking what this wanted to accomplish and adding a whole lot of, let's say, uh, 20, 20, tens and onwards concepts onto it so modularity and everything <clears throat> but uh the koreans also came up with their uh, modernization programs for this and nowadays the k1 itself the modernized version has sort of turned into the korean soft uh, special operations forces choice uh, so instead of running like a 10-5 uh, shorty a mark 18 they would actually run a decked out k1 but they got rid of this stock and they used a car 15 stock and so i actually kind of went reverse <laughs> they mm. added more links to the collapsing uh, segment even though they didn't need the buffer tube so it's kind of interesting how the roles reverse right there any final thoughts on this i was very impressed with the roof korean special the k1a1 yeah, pleasantly surprised. I I figured, like it's always it's always exciting to watch a rifle do well, and you could see our excitement when it just like cleared four hundred and four fifty, and we were like, "Holy crap!" And then we did find the wall. You know, we did find the wall on where it fell off. But again, like 
within context, this was a, a lot of fun to shoot. It was a lot of fun to delve into the back end history, the connotations that the K1A1 in, endures in your mind. And it was, at the end of the day, it was an absolute pleasure to document something that is not very commonly seen. And we have to thank our patron, Steve, for loaning us the firearm itself. If you guys stick around, check out the podcast episode where Dave, an arms dealer whose family used to deal with the Norinco Type 56s, he and I talk about the era of when the K1A1 was coming into the country and how the Norinco and Polytech Type 56s came into the country and made some of the first bucks for the Chinese market back in the day over at the podcast segment. But this is a good run, and we shall see you guys on the range.